When people go right, I always tend to go left. Welcome to The Limits, I'm Jay Williams. And that is Hollywood powerhouse Tracy Oliver. Let me tell you something. Even if Tracy tends to go left, she is always headed in the right direction. Her self-assured contrarian streak started when she was just a young girl. Growing up in South Carolina, she put on a Stanford sweatshirt and declared to her family at 12 years old, that's where I'm going to college. As luck would have it, she was in the same class as Issa Rae. Together, they made the misadventures of Awkward Black Girl, the smash hit web series that was the precursor for Insecure. Now, Tracy's got a host of other achievements to her name, from becoming the first black woman to write a movie that grossed over $100 million, to signing an eight-figure developmental deal with Apple. I asked Tracy about all that and more, and about trusting her intuition, that spiritual sense guiding her down her illustrious yet grounded path. So let's get to it. Here's my conversation with the one and only Tracy Alvin. Tracy, first off, thank you so much for doing this. You look amazing. How are you? Thank you. I'm really, really good. It's a beautiful day in New York. So I have to tell you, I've been very excited to talk to you. You and my producer, Lena, were just speaking before we started filming this live. And um, she actually told me about a clip that I went back and I watched uh, this morning on YouTube, which is the College Will of Fortune. Hi, Tracy. Uh, Tracy Oliver from Columbia, South Carolina, yes. but going to school at Stanford. Hopefully you will see me on television one day. And I have to tell you, you made it to the final round. You were giving four words in total and ended up with four letters to go off of. I watched the clip and <laughs> the fact that you got my gift to, my you, gift to you at the buzzer. How did you get that? It was like Pat Sajak didn't know. He was like, how the hell did you get that? And it reminded mm -hmm. me of like one of these critical clutch shots that an athlete makes down the stretch where somebody's like, how did he... Or how did she make that? Like what, to me, like what went through your mind when you were able to come out, of, come up with that out of thin air? Lena, I'm going to kill you, first of all, <laughs> for showing that. <laughs> I have not talked about that maybe in like 15 years. But um, I feel like sports is like the perfect analogy for that. Because mm. it really, I don't know if you can relate to this, but it felt almost spiritual. Yeah. Like I remember... Yes when my mom was, cause she was in the audience and she was like, how did that happen? And I just felt like the universe or I felt like there was a higher power that just kind of like made it make sense in my head. And I just said it out loud. It was really weird. But, and another weird thing about it and not to get too kooky, I- I love kooky though, Tracy. So you do? It to me. Yes. Okay. Um, so I started to watch Wheel of Fortune with my grandmother and mm. she passed before I got into the show. And so I always felt like me getting on there was kind of like a nod to her. And wow. then when the puzzle was my gift to you, it almost felt like that was her. It was weird, but I, it almost felt like she was there. Um, so that was something that I always like took away from it was that even though she wasn't physically there, she was there in spirit. It's funny that that's life, though, right? It's um, mm -hmm. if you pay attention to signs that are given to you. I mean, it, first off, the fact that my gift to you, that's mm -hmm. your grandmother's show, it, the world colliding at the perfect time, it's almost like destiny. That's exactly where you are supposed to be at that given time. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think even since then, I've been big on synchronicities and nudges and just following my heart and intuition. Even if it doesn't make sense to me all the way, I just kind of go for it. But it's kind of worked out really well when I do that. But I sometimes am hesitant to admit it out loud because I think a lot of people are not as spiritual or don't live their life in that type of way. So, yeah, even even the Will of Fortune was that for me. That's such an incredible, powerful story to will something into existence. And obviously you following your intuition and getting there. But I want to talk about the origination of this process for you to get into what you're doing now. And obviously you're extremely successful, but I wanna go back to the 90s for a second when there were so many black comedies on TV, like The Fresh Prince, Living Single, Moesha, Martin, and the list goes on. But what did it mean for you to see those narratives on screen as a kid? It meant that it was possible for black people to just have careers in that space and to be storytellers and weirdly 
a lot of those 90s sitcoms didn't have black writers. Hmm. So the representation was there on screen, but a lot of them didn't necessarily reflect the on-screen diversity behind the camera. And growing up in South Carolina, I extra didn't know how to navigate it or who wrote those shows. I think because of social media now, writers have become more public. So you kind of see a path or you see the people behind it, but I just didn't know that. And then when I started to get into it, I was like, oh, there's a long way to go for like creators and writers, but I at least had hope um, from growing up, I think in like the 90s heyday of black entertainment that I could even go into it, even though I had no clue how to start. And I had no inclination growing up in South Carolina that I would ever even find my way, but somehow it worked out. From South Carolina to Stanford, Mm -hmm. uh, first off, tell me about what Stanford meant to you. How did you find your way there? And especially how did that time in media and in college set up for the foundation of your early career? I, my dad's going to kill me if I don't say this. So I was like, me and my dad were obsessed with you when I was Wait, in high me? school. Yes. Stop. I'm Stop, not Tracy. No, I have to say this because he's going to kill me. So my dad went to Duke. Um, and my sister went to Duke and like my How do we lose family- you? What happened? How come you did what happened? I know. I know. It was a whole thing, but again, when everybody goes right, I go left. So I picked Stanford on the random. I'm not even kidding. When I was like twelve, I heard it was a good school and then and I heard that it was in California. And I was like, Well, California sounds fun. And so then my mom said, I just started to wear Stanford shirts around. I had n- never been there, had literally just wearing the shirt around. It just made no sense, but I picked it out. And then at 17, 18, I applied for it and got in. And then I ended up just like going to Stanford. But I'm liking this whole contrarian attitude, though. It's like uh, it, it seems to have gotten you in a lot of incredible places with that mindset. But so take me to Stanford. It was a bit of a culture shock when I got there, because even though I had manifested it and thought that it was meant for me, I hadn't actually spent a lot of time there and didn't know what I was getting myself into. So my immediate reaction was, it changed, but my immediate reaction was, I don't belong here. And then eventually that thing and me just kicked in, um, that like competitive spirit where I was like, no, you're going to fight your way through this and you're going to belong here. And then I just did. I started to like carve out a path in the arts there. I started like a theater company. Um, my freshman year, I met Issa Rae. And while we were there, we just kind of started to collaborate and figure out like how can these two unlikely black women forge a path in an industry that no one wants us to be in because at that point we were not in the 90s heyday there was Hmm. nothing with black women on the air in particular so again it was like you're fighting this fight that you don't know if you're going to be able to like win but we were both down for like the the hustle and to try it out but I do feel like once again, it was a, another, hmm, maybe we were supposed to like connect on some level. So Tracy, it, it, it's on this show, I've gotten a chance to talk to some incredible, like pretty incredible people. Um, Maverick Carter being one of them, who I kind of call him the architect of the design of LeBron James trajectory in his mm-hmm. business. And we really discussed in depth imposter syndrome I had the same similar experience going to Duke. Um, you know, there were only about 20 black kids on campus. I naturally gravitated towards them, but kind of learning how to go in and out of different worlds, right? And becoming adaptive. Mm-hmm. How do you think you and Issa, obviously you guys, and we can get into context about what you guys are able to do, but how did you guys start that adaptability? And what was that process like for you both? Um, I would say we're both kindred spirits in the sense of she's not afraid of a no either. And 
when you're both not afraid of a no, like you kind of don't let a lot stand in your way. So that was something that we kind of just bonded over. And it was like, if Stanford's not exactly what we want it to be, we'll create the Stanford that we need to have to make us feel welcome. So we walked into a situation that wasn't laid out for us. <laughs> like, hmm. And then by the end, it was like, okay, let's use Stanford to our advantage. Part of being at a school like this is like, you do have access to funding. You can apply for grants. People will like give you money to put on shows and stuff. And so then we just kind of created a world in which we could write and produce and act and direct. And But yeah, you just you make it the experience that you need it to be. And I think sometimes people feel like if something's not already laid out for them, it's not for them. But that just means you have to create it for yourself. And so in that way, I thought it was empowering. And I thought Stanford was the perfect place because not all schools have the resources to be able to give you what you need to thrive too. (sighs) So good. So let's talk about creating that for yourself, just to provide context, 2009, 2010, you and Issa are making the misadventures of an awkward black girl. Oh, hey, girl. Talk to me about what the grind of not only getting a show made pretty independently, but staying the course even when it felt like no one truly believed in you. Yeah, it felt like, I mean, there was dark moments, too, because when you, the, the downside of graduating from Stanford and you're incredibly broke and all of your classmates are in medical school or law school and you know there's a path for them and you're working like minimum wage jobs to try to like just get by and there's no path for entertainment your self-esteem suffers <laughs> like your confidence like goes down and you're just kind of like am I doing all this for nothing am I going to have egg on my face at the end of it and there are also a lot of people because they're afraid of doing what you're doing who want to poke holes in it who want to say, like, this is not going to work out. You guys are doing something stupid. And I am grateful that we had each other. But we would take turns with, like, low self-esteem or take turns with, like, hey, can you front this because I don't have it, you know? So we were mm-hmm. just kind of, like, paying for stuff, borrowing. I would borrow from my family. She would borrow from her family. We would swear to people we were going to pay them back. And then we were like, please, God, let us be able to pay this back. <laughs> um, but we were just, like... <laughs> going back and forth but yeah when you really have faith and also when something has to work out when you put so much into it and it has to you kind of like make sure that it does that right here seems to be the essence of who tracy is you work crazy hard you believe in yourself and then you have the faith that it's somehow somehow gonna work out next up we hear what happened with that web series and how she and Issa Rae reacted when a studio executive told them they already reached the peak of their careers. This is The Limits from NPR. I'm Jay Williams. You want to stay with us for this. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Aspiration. How can you help join in the fight against climate change? With Aspiration Zero, the credit card that helps to plant trees with every swipe. To date, Aspiration members have funded the planting of 75 million trees. Aspiration is not a bank. Visit aspiration.com slash limits today to learn how you can make a big difference through small changes. Plus, spend $3,000 in the first 90 days and earn a $300 bonus. Terms and conditions apply. Good credit required. Welcome back. When we left off, we were talking with Tracy Oliver about her early career collaboration with Issa Rae. Let's get into it. Tracy, what do you think was one of the darkest times that you guys had during that period where you felt like maybe, I'm not sure we can move forward? I would actually say, and this is a a weird moment that happened, but the internet was clamoring for it and it made a lot, we did a Kickstarter and we raised so much money to finish the season and like we had millions and millions of views. But then when we would go to meet with executives, they would say to us, that's cute that you guys have this internet following, but like one exec, one exec in particular, I still remember this meeting, looked Issa in her face, I was sitting right there and said, no one wants to look at you, like on their television screen and said that she wasn't attractive enough and that um, 
she's an internet star but not a tv star and that for us was like oh you know because it, it was like it's one thing when you get like praise and stuff from the masses but then we were like so nothing we did mattered that's what it felt like it felt like a gut punch when he said that and then also it was just like so anti-black he said this to your face Tracy? yeah was- yeah it, it was it was very and he then said you know they want a lauren london type i remember it was lauren london in particular that he said and so isa as a dark-skinned black woman mm-hmm. it was very obvious what that meant and so to have to kind of unpack that with her and to be like, you're beautiful, fuck that. Yeah, it was really, really upsetting and hurtful because that's the part of you you can't control. You know, you can do all the other stuff, but if someone just looks at you and says, like, I don't like how you look, like, what do you do about that? You know, Tracy, I, I, I talked to my mom about this because my mom was born in 1950 and she worked her tail off to get... Mm-hmm. Uh, multiple degrees to finally become a principal. And um, there were so many white people who were above her that just never thought that she could attain that. And they would say some of the most random, hurtful things. I mean, one one principal in particular said, nobody like you will ever rise to the power or position that I'm at. And I remember hearing that as a, as a young child. Mm-hmm. Um, and it always, it always blew my mind. How did you guys keep your collective or your composure? Or did you? Um, we just kind of had to take a beat and be like, well, either we take this one guy seriously or we just say he's an idiot and we just keep going. And we took that path of being like, he doesn't know what he's talking about. So I often wonder when Insecure came out, like what he thought about it because I'm like yeah you know it's just like it's so crazy but Hmm. just feels so much better when you like you beat them that way with success hopefully he's not an executive anymore but that's just me personally I don't (laughs) I I've heard you say this before don't look at what's on the air to figure out what you want to do do the thing that's missing Mm -hmm. what was missing in your mind when you were starting out and what do you think is missing today? Mm. That's a good question. Um, so much was missing when when we finished film school. It felt like there just wasn't enough representation in general. And then in the comedy space, there just hadn't been like a platform for a black woman to be a lead in anything. You were always kind of like the second or third or fourth lead. And were kind of like the funny sidekick. So you weren't given like a three-dimensional character. Like you were kind of always reacting to or responding to whatever issues the the white lead was going through. Hmm. But you never went home with that person. You never saw like the black person's family or got to know them in any way. So I was like, there's so much missing from these stories because we're not allowed to like go home with them and like see what their lives are like. So we're only getting like a glimpse of it. So I was like, what if we like had a show where you went home with the (laughs) the black woman and you like saw like what her inner life is like and like what she's like outside of this workplace, if it was a workplace comedy or whatever. And it, it shouldn't have been such a novel concept, but then it was people were like, but who will watch that? You know, how how will people be able to relate? And I'm like the same way that I relate to white women. You know, they're still women. I'm like, Mm -hmm. I can still watch this and appreciate it for what it is, even if we don't have the same cultural background. So I'm like, so just use that same logic here. So to me, I'm like time and time again, we've proven that like black women can be relatable and can be enjoyed by the mainstream. But that's always something then you had to like, prove and now I would say even with proving it um if I ever try to go out in a new genre I'm starting over it feels like so they'll be like okay well now we know that black girls can be funny and can be in comedies but I don't know if we can put them in horror I don't know if we can put them in space yet like it's always like something where you're like okay well let me try you know to start this new conversation so I would say now what's missing is just different genres um 
they're more comfortable keeping you in something that's been proven before. So anytime you kind of like branch out of it, you have to kind of start back over and prove yourself all over again. How do you articulate that to executives, Tracy? How do you mm-hmm. find that commonality for executives to really listen to mm-hmm. what you're talking about? And how has that changed from before to where you are now? Um, I would say it's still kind of an issue, to be honest. I think that still, yeah, I think that you can have some executives that don't necessarily have any direct experience with black culture, but they're open minded enough to employ people that do or they are open minded enough to say, this is not my experience, but this is yours. So I'm going to give you the leeway to do what you do for your community or to lean into your culture. And then you have some executives that they don't care. If they don't get it, it means it doesn't make sense and it doesn't work. And it's really sad, but (laughs) we have like group texts where you kind of even, if you talk to other creatives of color, you'll, they'll say like, oh, this is a friendly room or this is a not friendly room or this person, like (laughs) go to this exec because like he's married to a black woman, so he might get it. Like, you know, it's like, oh, (laughs) it's like that type of, I know. It's the blueprint though. We need it. Yes. Yes. I want to I want to set the stage for this because I've been dying to talk to you about this um, girls trip, which you wrote and came out in 2017. Obviously, it was a game changer for you. You're the first black woman to write a movie that grossed over one hundred million dollars. Wow. It's uh, just saying that out loud is beautiful. Just tell me about the journey, about how you got there, Tracy. Take me through that process. Yeah. So anyone who knows me even for five minutes knows that I'm, I love to drink and have a, <laughs> and have a good time. Okay. So, Cocktail I, of choice? Cocktail yeah. of choice? Do you have a go-to? Um, lately, I really like an old fashioned because I'm getting grown and mature now. Um, okay. Yeah. Or like a Negroni. I'm, I'm getting so mature. It used to be just like Kool-Aid with vodka in it. Just like <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> sweet stuff but you know now i'm mature the sophistication Um, of the palate i like it okay yes yeah and i the movie was like marketed or announced in deadline as like a party movie with black women Mm. in new orleans and i was like oh my god i have to (laughs) write this so then i reached out and then was immediately told we already hired somebody and i was so bummed because i was like if ever there was a project for me, that would have been it. I went to drinks with a friend a year later, and he happened to mention, oh, there's this movie, Girl Trip, that I feel like you should be writing. And mm-hmm. I said, oh, well, they hired someone already. And he's like, oh, no, I just heard it's back open again. I left drinks with him right then and there to go call and say it's back open I want in and then was told again that oh well they're already far down the line like with a different writer so it's probably not gonna work out and then I basically was like please let me in there I basically begged for the opportunity so much that the producer Will Packer was like fine let's get her in the room and it was supposed to be kind of a formality to like okay we heard you now get lost and the idea was good enough for them to be like, okay, now we're going to advance you to the next round, which is to pitch to the studio. I pitched like it was like you having to win a championship. Like I went in there and laid it out like on the table. Mm -hmm. Maybe two hours after I pitched, my manager said, you're not going to believe this. You turned a bunch of no's into a yes. And so he was like, Universal is going to go with you. And I was like, what? And I was just, I was stunned. So you're, you're forcing it into will for yourself. That's beautiful. Yeah. And no one thought it was going to be a big movie, you know? So it was like. Including yourself? I, I always believe in myself more than everybody else. So I thought it was going to be big. Did I think it was going to be a hundred million dollars big? No. But I, it was only a $19 million budget. So I was like, we can make that back. So I, th- I thought we'd hit like 70. Um what a great ROI. I know. Oh my now, goodness. They, everyone was underpaid because it was <laughs> supposed to be a small movie. And then I remember opening weekend and I was like watching the numbers come in and like Universal will send like the tracking and stuff like that. And I remember my mom called me in South Carolina and she was like, 
oh, it's a hit. White people are up in this movie. So she was... <laughs> my mom my mom was doing her own tracking and oh, she it. she said oh no it's a hit because she was like i can't even get in here because she was like white people are buying up rows and rows and rows of this so she was like it's not just a black movie like you girl you got a big movie i was like that's crazy it's incredible yeah i was gonna ask you tracy does it because i said it and and, and sometimes you know people say things to me obviously never at this degree but like oh yeah jay your second pick in the draft and you get used to hearing it, but I often found times where I would settle in and think to myself, damn, I was, regardless of how my career went, it was a second pick in the NBA draft. That's, in, that's incredible. So I, I mm-hmm. say that thinking, when I said to you, you are the first black woman to write a movie that grossed over $100 million, has that truly settled in for you yet? And what does that come with? I didn't believe it at the time. I really didn't. It was the the fact came out on the internet. I I was on Twitter and someone tweeted, "Tracy is the first black woman to write a hundred million dollar movie," and I was like, "That's not true." I just was like, "That can't be true." So then I went on a mission to prove him wrong because I was like, "I don't want to claim this until like I've exhausted all of my search." So then I was like, Shonda Rhimes, she wrote, um, and I remembered she had written um, a Princess Diaries sequel and then Mm -hmm. had done a Britney Spears movie. And I was like, one of those had to have cleared 100. So I looked at it and then it it tapped out at like 80. And I was like, huh, okay. Hmm. So then I was like, okay, what about this movie? And so then I just kept (laughs) going and like looking at movies that like had black leads thinking, okay, well this one had to have, and I I was like coming to America. And then I was like, oh, white men wrote this. Okay, this movie, ooh, white woman wrote this. Mm -hmm. And I just could not, and I was like, so every hit that had black people in it didn't have a woman behind it, a black woman behind it? I couldn't believe it. So after that happens, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I would naturally expect for the world to open up. Did you find that to be the case that the world opened up to you? Or did you find it surprising that any of those doors remained closed? I would definitely say it was a lot easier to sell things post girls trip for sure, especially with black women in them, because Mm -hmm. now I didn't have to face the, well, it's not mainstream. It's not, you know, going to make a return. It's a small thing. Once you make $100 million, people can't use that anymore. Hmm. So that excuse went away. But the thing that was still hard was if I wanted to do something outside of Girl Strip. Even if you're like, I now want to do um, a black thriller like, you know, a murder mystery or something. They're like, ooh, that's that's not girls partying and drinking. I don't know if that is something you should tackle or I don't know if there's, like, money for that. So, so you still feel like you're in the box to a degree? Yeah, you're constantly having to prove yourself. And if you are a person that doesn't want to stay doing the same thing, because you can make a good living, honestly, never pivoting. Like, <laughs> if you just stay in your lane. Unfortunately, uh, maybe because I'm a Gemini, I don't know. I get bored easily. So I'm kind of like, <laughs> nah, I want to keep doing different things. So it's interesting to me to try to do different genres and try to push myself to not just write. Maybe I'll direct, like maybe I'll produce. So I'm always trying to get outside of what people want me to do. But when you do that, you're constantly having to work hard and, and prove yourself over and over again. So... It's on. It's partially on me that I make my life so hard. <laughs> Coming up on The Limits, how Tracy stays grounded and groundbreaking after the doors of the entertainment world open before her eyes. This episode is brought to you by Data IQ, the AI platform that connects data and doers through everyday AI. Every day, Data IQ customers are turning complex data into tangible results fueling use cases from the mundane to the moonshot. Because it's only data until you make it a business strategy or challenge an entire industry. Without you, it's just data. Visit d a t 
A-I-K-U dot com to learn more. This message comes from NPR sponsor Discover. Discover could talk about how complicated other banks make credit card rewards, like how there are minimums, or worse, rewards that flat out expire. But they'd rather talk about how with Discover, you can redeem your rewards for cash in any amount at any time. Talk about amazing. And now that you've had that talk, it's time to get back to what this podcast talks about. Learn more at discover.com slash redeem rewards. Terms apply. Welcome back to The Limits. And we are about to hear Tracy Oliver talk about Black Hollywood and how to set healthy boundaries in a competitive and, yes, often toxic industry. Nisi Nash said something to me um, when I was interviewing her on my pod, and we were talking about community support. And when I lived in L.A. for a short stint, I I saw for the first time what Black Hollywood was like. And Mm -hmm. it's a real thing. Do you feel that... What what has Black Hollywood meant to you? And where do you see yourself within that sphere? Hmm. I'm kind of a weirdo. I would say if you judged my content, you would say I'm totally up all through and like just in the middle of Black Hollywood. But as far as like how I live my life, I'm so not that. Hmm. Um that it's kind of a disconnect, I think, for people. So, and the reason why I say that is like, I'm not really into Hollywood type of stuff. So you kind of have to twist my arm to get me to go to like industry parties. I actually think my strength as a writer is because I really like people and I like life um, Mm. outside of it. So I don't think that I would be able to write Girl Strip if I hadn't actually like been stumbling it. down drunk like yeah. <laughs> and gone you know abroad or gone to essence but i that's my life like it's coming from an authentic place and so i i'm less interested in that part of black hollywood but if you looked at the work you would say oh she's you know a key member <laughs> of it but hmm. no i think sometimes it's very clicky and then people that move out there who are nerdy or not very cool or even not stereotypically black um feel like they don't belong Hmm. and so i always like point out to people that you can be on the outside but be on the inside because i'm i'm that way too i've seen a lot of people over the last decade that have been in entertainment kind of get caught up in the chase and when things don't go well it begins this dark dark spiral it's it's not a friendly industry in that way there's a lot of suicides a lot of drug use there's a lot of um substance abuse and a lot of depression a lot of dark energy where people are trying to take you out and i'm not saying that to like you know be negative i'm saying it because like it's true and you can be successful without engaging in that. You can maintain your lightness. And that's what I try to do. And I think by living outside of it, I'm able to maintain that, if that makes sense. So it's no. also for, it's for mental health reasons. Yes. Yeah, no, it, and that's something that we have to value and cherish. And I mean, I've seen so many athletes, entertainers that get consumed with that world mm-hmm. and always feeling this need to be seen. Yes. To, yes. It, and it's That's like, what it but is. I, yeah. I already see you though. You know, I yeah. see you. I don't need to see mm-hmm. that alternative version of you. That's, I think that was very well said, Tracy. Um, one of the things that I've been on the verge of, of doing is, you know, with a couple of different athlete partners of mine is creating a, a production company and the value of ownership, I think is, is so mm. important as we kind of take the next steps in, in, in what we're doing economically. And first off, congratulations to you because I know your production company, Tracy Yvonne Productions, secured an eight figure deal with Apple in 2021. Mm-hmm. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Uh, I think that's incredible. I, what led you to find your own company and what what has the mission been? Well, for me, I knew that I wanted to expand. I was getting to a point where 
again, it's that intellectual curiosity and like wanting to just have my hands in so many things, but I'm also one person. So mm. it just felt like a natural kind of like transition into a production company because I wanted to be able to do so much anyway. And I'm very loyal. I like to surround myself with people that I know have good character and that also have lives. Like I'm, so my executive is a college friend um, that was transitioning from being a lawyer into being a producer. So it was kind of a, like a non-traditional choice, but I wanted someone that I could trust and that I valued their opinion and that they lived a real life. And so Mm -hmm. together, we just kind of make it our mission to find projects that are entertaining. And, and the reason why that's so important to me is there's so much attention placed on black struggle and black pain all the time. And I was just like, I just like sometimes sitting in a theater and laughing and like, and forgetting about my problems. And there's something very fun and escapist about the world of cinema. So let's not exploit like black pain and black struggle all the time because there's so much more um, to us than that. And so that's first and foremost, our mission is to find things that like are actually entertaining and uplifting. Um, it doesn't have to be heavy or important, like just like friendships or love stories or, you know, thrillers that are, you know, fun to watch. So we look for things that are entertaining. Um, and then I also try to find, I guess, spaces that are not overdone. Hmm. Um, I don't want to be like, competing in a space that everybody else is in. So when again, everybody if, goes left, you go right. Yes. <laughs> when do you find time for Tracy and who is Tracy <sighs> without what you do? Mm-hmm. The time part is hard. Like you have to really, really try to carve it out. And I wasn't always good at it. I'm getting better at it now. And that's because I've, I think COVID kind of exposed that to me. Um, I think COVID kind of exposed that to a lot of people, but it pointed out how little what we do matters. Like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) because it could all end so quickly that it just called into question to me, like, you know, I, before COVID would be like, oh, I'll see my mom at Thanksgiving or I'll, you know, catch up with my friends, like, you know, whenever I get through this. And all of a sudden when you can't see people or like pre-vaccines, I was genuinely worried if if my parents would survive. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, you had an opportunity to see them, to just hop on a flight and see them freely for years. And, and, and now it's like, you may not be able to, um, and you just don't know how that's going to work. So what that did for me coming out of it was like, Oh, I got to prioritize this stuff. I think one of the challenges that I've had over the last two years is I don't I don't know if you see it this way, Tracy, but I don't look at what I do as work and whether it's with my podcast, whether it's me on TV, my production company, things that I like to get invested in. It's just it's how I breathe. Um, Mm. But it's been really hard for me, I think, finding this sense of self. And I'm going through a difficult time right now with my mother and um it's uh, when you have so many things going on, they are good distractions, but sometimes I don't focus on me and what's the right mm-hmm. thing that I need in order to keep me where I need to be mentally instead mm-hmm. of there's a lot of outgoing. There's not a lot of incoming. Yeah. Um, the sense of self thing is that's interesting. Um, like going back to your question of like who I am. I mean, I think it's constantly evolving, but where I'm landing right now, which is so so weird, is that I feel like I'm going back to the beginning. Hmm. Um, And I am recently like, nah, you're the girl who does whatever. Like you've always, you're the person for no reason who put on a Stanford shirt and just manifested it. You're the person Hmm. that like heard about college week for Wheel of Fortune and you're said I'm gonna go be on Wheel of Fortune and you auditioned and got it like you just you know you never used to follow like you you would lead and do your own thing and unapologetically so and that was one of the reasons I had to kind of take a step back um from Hollywood and 
like tune into my own thoughts and what's in my head because the busier you get the more voices are that are in your ear and the more I think confused and disconnected you can get from who you are Hmm. I want to tie it all together Um, (laughs) you said on that college will of fortune that incredible when you shout out my gift to you and you told this incredible story about your grandmother when it's all said and done Tracy what is the gift you want to leave for the people that see your work? I always tend to write women that are messy and flawed and challenging, but also loving and like deeply wanting of social connection that's why I always write about like female friendships and like it's always usually a love story between women and the reason why that matters to me and what I want to leave behind is that we can be all things and we don't have to be perfect and we don't have to have the perfect relationship or the perfect man or woman you know whatever your sexual orientation is we don't have to have any of that stuff to be whole and so that's why I tend to always try to find like humanity and joy and singlehood or joy within women, like whether it's friendships or whether it's like, you know, siblings or mom or whatever, because I think the message too often is that we're not enough as we are. And so, yeah, I would say that's what I want to leave behind. Well, you are more than enough with a lot more to give. And I, uh, I applaud you for everything that you've accomplished. I hope I get a chance to meet you in person one day. Likewise. Sit down and talk to you and tell your dad I said hello as well. Okay, I will. <laughs> I will. Tracy, thank you. Thank you so much. That was the great Tracy Oliver. Now, I often feel this way after an interview, <laughs> but I really hope that she and I can talk one day over an old fashioned or a Negroni because I loved learning from her. And I know she has so many more stories to tell. Don't forget to check out Tracy's latest show, Harlem, on Amazon Prime. And as always, remember, stay positive and let's keep it moving.